Community gets to see that there are people that care, that come out and help out and show the love of Christ. Well, we're doing a clothing store. I think there's over 99 people going to be here um, getting clothes. It's for gifts for moms. It's for single um, parents, single parent organization. We do it because we just want to love the community here. Just giving back to the people that are here, it just gives us an opportunity to be God's hands and feet. We are doing this to help others in need and to show love to those that are not expecting it. Well, today we're out here packing food for hungry children all over the world. So in the spirit of Love Does the Unexpected, we have a great, great carnival here at Mendenhall Elementary. All the funds that are raised are basically given to the PTA of Mendenhall Elementary. I'm doing lots of projects at Cornerstone Ranch. It's part of our Love Does the Unexpected. We just want to come and be a part of our community. Hi, I'm Jay Bruner. Hashtag Love Does the Unexpected. I'm Maddie, and I'm out here because Love Does the Unexpected. I'm Melody Marshall, and I'm here because Love Does the Unexpected. Hi, Chase Oaks. That video just fired me up. I just love Texas people. We're doing this to help others in need. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. So, man, I, I hope you guys are doing wonderful. It's always an honor to be here. I just want to welcome all of you here at Legacy and everybody at Woodbridge Campus, at Sloan Creek, Richardson, Espanol, and all of you online all around the world. Thank you for joining us. We hope that in a very real way, you already feel loved and welcomed, even if you're brand new around here. We just are really glad to have you. So, man, have you guys been enjoying this series, Love Does the Unexpected? You guys, yeah? Yeah, it's been so good. I'll tell you, um, there's a lot of unexpected things happening in our world. Last week, I don't know if you saw it, but Taylor Swift came out with a new video. And I was really, uh, it was unexpected for me because her last album was like so mean and snakes and she had a bad reputation and this video was like butterflies and happy and sweet and I was like, there you are, Tay-Tay. <laughs> so another thing was Avengers, any Avengers fans? Yeah? So this movie Endgame was like one of the largest, if not the largest movie of all time. Come on, praise God. That is, the only thing I wish is that um, Thor wouldn't have been so fat. Well, that dude was a chunky monkey. But anyway, one more thing, and I'll, I'll stop with all of the jokes. But um, I, I have another thing unexpected in my life. My oldest daughter, Madison, is now a fiance. She was proposed to. She's getting married in September. Come on. I'm finally going to have a boy. So I am fired up. So yeah, this series has been amazing. If you didn't see last week, Pastor Jeff, he taught on the Good Samaritan and he taught about unexpected compassion. It's one of the best Good Samaritan talks I've ever heard. And, and hearing this talk about this guy that was left vulnerable and naked in a ditch and then to be loved on by this Samaritan was so beautiful in explaining uh, God's love and compassion and kindness. And unfortunately for many people, uh, the perception of Christians is not compassion and kindness. In fact, most people, if they were to describe a Christian, would be words like um, they're, they're judgmental, that there's lots of hatred and bigotry, homophobic, and just plain mean. That's, that's the general idea of what our society thinks of Christians. And then I was actually really brokenhearted when Jeff explained that Generation Z, which is ages 3 through 23, which makes up 25% of our um, country, they actually would say that churches and Christians are no good for society and they're part of the problem. And um, man, that broke my heart. Perception is reality, right? And so learning to help other people's perception change takes a lot of work. And so um, that's, that's our goal. In this series, we're hoping that um, we can step into that and love people in ways that, 
that they'd be surprised by. Like, there's no way that a believer would do that. Let's, let's, let's blow up people's perception of Christians and do things that just would have been, they'd have been like, I can't believe they, they did that. And that's kind of the movement that I think we're starting here. And, and you know what, Chase Oaks, you guys do that in massive ways. Um, you guys are proof that, that Jesus really is the hope of the world. You are proof that the church really is the vehicle God uses to change the world. And the way that you love people is, is just, it breaks down walls and barriers unlike very, very few churches I've seen in, in the entire world. So I'm really proud of you. So to teach this, this lesson today about um, unexpected welcome is, is, is going to be a blast. I'm fired up about it. So if everybody would, at every single campus, would you guys say these two words on the count of three? One, two, three. Unexpected welcome. So we're going to be teaching from Luke chapter 7, if you have your Bibles. I'd love for you to open up to that. And I am fired up about this text. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to dive right in. Here we go. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair, right? And then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Real fast, just so we're all clear, I love to do this. If you're a sinner, would you raise your hand? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, you just lied, and you're now a sinner. (laughs) Welcome. It's good to have you. So, have you ever gone somewhere and you immediately knew, oh, 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 so like, I am not welcome here. Like, all y'all jokers don't like me. And you felt completely unwanted and not welcomed. Well, I think we've all experienced that before in our life. In fact, um, here's maybe a few ways that you have possibly felt rejected. One, maybe you had a family member cut you out, which is one of the deepest kinds of pain when it's somebody that's supposed to love you with all their heart, right? Or maybe it was a friend, and your friend was your person. It was your safest person to go to, and you shared everything, and now they, they just don't want you around anymore. Or maybe you did go through a breakup in a relationship or even a divorce, and you had the deepest kind of intimacy, and now that's gone. Or, or maybe it is racial discrimination, and you felt, I'm not wanted or welcomed in this room. Or maybe for you, um, you you didn't get the job. You applied, you were hoping, and you felt rejected. Or you had the job and you lost it and you got fired. Or maybe for you, you found out someone was gossiping or criticizing you and talking smack. And um, they they hurt you in the deepest level by by rejecting you and making you feel unwelcome. We've all felt that in some point in our life. We've known what it's like to to be uh, not wanted. In fact, I'm gonna tell you a story from my own life when I felt this uh, for the very first time. I'll never forget. I remember this feeling. I, I can feel all the feels even though it was in second grade. And so I'll never forget. I, I went to, um, I think it was Kmart, and they had one of those little machines you put a quarter in. I put the quarter in, begged my mom for the quarter. She gave it to me, and I got the little plastic thing that had the red lid, and I was hoping to get the big bouncy ball. You know, that you could just hit, and it goes all the way to the ceiling. Come on, you guys remember that, right? Well, I didn't get the bouncy ball. Instead, I got a dumb ring. <laughs> and so I was like, ah. And so I was laying in bed that night looking at my little ring, and, and I got an idea. I was going to give my ring the next day on the playground to the prettiest girl in the school named Tracy. Now, I'd never done anything like this. 
My, I had all brothers, and when I would try to talk to girls, I had real problems. I didn't know how they think back then. And now I have five in my house, and it's still true. <laughs> but I was like, I'm going to try my hardest to go to, to Tracy Mall. I'm going to give her this ring. So I walk up. <laughs> She's on the playground. She's on the monkey bars. And Lisa was with her. And Lisa was another girl in the school. It was the most beautiful girl in the school. The two prettiest girls are right there. And I'm standing there with my little red. <laughs> and I'm just waiting for them to get off. And I'm staring at them. <laughs> and they get off of the monkey bars. And they get down and they walk up to me and they're like, Hi, Blake. Um, did you need something? And I was like, Yes, Tracy, I think you're very pretty. And I want to give you this to you. I held out the ring, and she took it out of my hand. She opened the lid. She looked at the ring, and she put it back in the thing. She closed it back, hands it to me, and says, that's okay. I don't want it. And so I was crushed. I took it, and you won't believe what I did. I took off sprinting, and I'm like, I ran all the way across the entire playground. I found a place in the ground. I dug a hole. I put the ring in it, and I was crying. And I'm wiping my tears off, and I was just a hot mess. Now, I'm not kidding. Here's what happened. Tracy felt horrible because she saw my hurt and disappointment, and I ran across the hole, right? And she's like, oh. <laughs> and she comes and finds me. And she's like, I'm sorry. You know what? I changed my mind. I do want the ring. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, come here. <laughs> here you go. <laughs> oh, man, it was just mortifying. The whole thing was horrible. And so anyways, what, what I'm trying to say is rejection sucks. That's, that's what I'm saying. And so I... I, it can make you feel all these feelings of like feeling alone and not wanted and anxiety and rejection, just, it just cuts to the core. And it also creates self-doubt and insecurity, but can also like make you really angry and, and jealous and mad. It can also do that. So feelings like you aren't wanted or welcome, it, it can destroy your self-worth if you allow it to. It's that moment when you get on Facebook and you realize all your friends are out having a blast and they're taking pictures and posting online and you never got the invite. Or maybe for you, it was when you were young and it was, it was on the playground or in, this, in the school lunchroom or maybe it was uh, even at your own house and you felt this same sort of thing when you were little from people that weren't supposed to make you feel rejected. At some point, we've all felt this kind of bigotry and hatred and rejection, slander, and not being welcomed. And that's exactly what's happening here in Luke chapter 7. Jesus had a way of making everybody feel welcome always. And he was this amazing example that left heaven and came to earth to show us how to love his children. And the religious leaders, they scorned him for the way that he loved people that he wasn't supposed to. They called him a friend of sinners. And he was known by who he spent time with. In fact, his association gave him a reputation. So he was called all kinds of names. Glutton. He was called a drunkard. He was even called demon-possessed. It bothered people that he would associate at all with the rejects of society. He would hang out with people that he just wasn't supposed to talk to. And he just gave them open arms. People that were, were sinners and people that were evil and people that just, they were tax collectors. <gasps> and so Jesus would, he just didn't give hatred. He didn't give bigotry. He, he loved unconditionally. And we don't know how to do that. We're conditioned to have conditions. But Jesus, man, you don't understand. He, he would actually talk to and love on and hug unclean lepers. These people whose skin were falling off and their arms, were, you know, parts were falling off. And he'd just open arms to love them. And he'd hang around with the sick and he'd touch them. 
and he, people that were supposed to be outside the city gates. He was with them. And, and you talk about this unexpected welcome. That was who Jesus is. He, he came and crushed cultural norms. And I think that's why I love this story so much. Jesus just didn't get it. He didn't play by the rules. He would, he would actually go to scoundrels' house and eat their food and drink their drinks. What? Yeah, he was a different kind of rabbi, different. He, he acted like he wasn't supposed to, and, and the people that had expectations that were at that level were mad at him for not acting like he was supposed to act. And that's probably why they had this party, to help kind of culture him, get him to act appropriately, to get in line. Have you ever been around people that you go, man, when I'm with you guys, you guys always make me feel like I'm just not quite as important as you. Like you're just a little bit better than me. And you just kind of feel like you're belittled or talked down to. Well, that's probably what's going on here. And in those moments, I like, I always go, man, I, I'm trying to be on my goodest behavior. You know, I'm trying to impress you all. My mom, is, she's got a master's in English. And when I said goodest just now, she's like, son, it's not right. But that's what's going on at this dinner party. He's, he's amongst the who's who, like the elite and the A-listers. But this party, man, it gets messed up. This girl walks in that's the town prostitute. And everybody knew, like, oh, look who just came in the door. Woo. Elbowing each other, looking at each other. This girl was the dirty girl. Everybody knew who she was. And this would have made, I'm talking a scene. It would have shut the party to everybody start whispering. Clearly, this woman, she loved Jesus. And that was the problem. Because Jesus, you're not supposed to love people like that. And so she's crying all over him. You know, you know how many tears it would take to actually be able to clean a person's foot with the tears? I mean, she's ugly crying, sobbing, just <laughs> that kind of cry, right? It's just a mess. And not just that, she takes out this alabaster jar of perfume that would have been worth a year's wages, very expensive. And she's just all over his head and on his feet and she's kissing his feet and it would have smelled up the entire room. The place would have had this fragrance. It's like, what? I'm talking made a massive scene. Let me put this into context. You like, hey, I'm gonna have a party. I'm gonna invite everybody I know that's the most important to me, the most influential people I know, my teachers, my coaches, my professors, my pastors. And you know what? I'm gonna have Jeff Jones come. So Jeff walks in the door. You're like, Jeff, hey, buddy. You're a lot shorter than I thought. But no. <laughs> I, that's so funny. He's like taller than me. I don't know. Anyways, Jeff walks in and then walks in like this very famous porn star. And she starts crying and kissing his feet and putting oil on his head. All of you would be like, Awkward. <laughs> like, what is happening? It would have got so quiet. You all would have been staring. And so then Simon, Simon finds himself going, you know what? You know what? Dude, you, you clearly are not a prophet because you would know this woman that's touching you, Jesus. And so he's sitting there thinking that in his head when this whole thing's going on. But it says, Jesus answered his thoughts. <laughs> It would be very, very unnerving. <laughs> you, you hear what's going on? He says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And I think the way that Simon replied after seeing this whole thing is like, well, go ahead, teacher. He says, go ahead, S Simon. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon answered, well, I, I, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right. 
And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The minute the table said amongst themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so these guys, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all these dudes, man, they're tools. <laughs> they're just high and mighty, judging. They just think that there's something. They're, they're better, acting better. They had to keep their perception of perfection, prim and proper. My kids would call them bougie. They were serious about reputation management. And that's why Jesus called them to their face, you whitewashed tombstones, brood of vipers. He said, he said, you're clean on the outside, but your insides, they're gross, dirty, they're filthy. And Jesus was trying to help them as well. He's trying to help them see that there's something wrong with their hearts. And I, I got to be honest, I kind of understand that. I've done this before. I'm ashamed of the fact that I've made people feel like they're not as important as me. Have you done that? Would your neighbors describe you as welcoming? Would your coworkers describe you as having open arms and being crazy accepting? Do you work hard to make people feel like, man, hey, you're included, you're a part of this? Or would you be described as, as cold and exclusive? In a society where individualism and isolation is celebrated, it's kind of weird to be like over the top kind and sweet and accepting and hospitable to all people. But Jesus... He was the exact representation of God. We see the heart of God. And the way that he welcomed everyone lets us see into heaven. The way that God sees his children. And isn't that the way that you really want to be? Isn't, isn't it true that we, we would want to be people that make time for other people in need? That we would stop if someone's in the ditch? That we'd stop our busy, that we'd stop our importance, and we'd get low, that we'd decrease so Christ can increase, right? Man, I do. I work hard at this, and I try to love everybody equally, and I know I have blinders, but I'm trying my hardest to tear down walls in my life, to, to remove things that separate or divide I don't want walls. I don't want borders in my own life. I know it's necessary to have that, uh, for our country, border control, but not spiritually, not in my heart, right? As far, as far as I can tell, loving your neighbor as yourself breaks down walls, it doesn't build them. Last week when I was watching the sermon, Jeff sort of said in passing, hey, next week we're going to be talking about uh, immigration, and I knew I was preaching, <laughs> And I was like, oh, oh, that's me. Okay, what do I have to say about immigration? And so I started praying and asking God. And I know this is a little bit sticky, but I'm just going to step into the sticky. Um, I think God's given me something to say. And I'm going to start with this story. So um, this last year I went to Panama to a very indigenous people group that aren't even recognized 
by the Panamanian government and uh, they have no roads to their place. It's an island group of people and they have nothing. They make a dollar a day if they catch a fish. That's what they have. And so I went there and gave them a generator and an entire wood shop and um, it radically changed their village. They're now able to make products and make chairs and they're helping people with their boats and making canoes and it's amazing what, the way God's using that. However, uh, while I was on my taxi drive in Panama, I had the taxi driver and I were talking. I was like, tell me what it's like here in Panama. He goes, well, we're really mad. Our people here are ticked off at how many illegal immigrants are coming into our country from Venezuela and from Guatemala and from Honduras, and they're, they're taking our Panamanian jobs. And I was like, really? He goes, and then our president, in fact, has come up with a slogan for the next campaign. And he's saying, let's make Panama great again. <laughs> I was like, well, that's original. <laughs> I guess I just want to say to you that this isn't just an American problem. Everywhere I go in the world, I've experienced people that want to come into new countries to make a better life for their families. And I can't blame them for that. People always want better opportunities. But as a pastor who's fighting to help other people become like Christ and to be Jesus people uh, who, who unashamedly uh, love with no conditions, it's important for, for me to say, you know, okay, as, as followers of Christ, we do have to be legal no matter where you're at in the world. Be legal in your country. But at the same time, if you are illegal, there is no place for hatred and bigotry. We are inclusive, not exclusive. We have open arms and open doors, not closed. A human is a human is a human created in the image of God. And the church, the church should be a place where every single person receives a crazy, unexpected welcome and lavished with people with grace. Not just in our building, though, in our hearts and in our lives, in our homes and around our dinner tables. Amen? I'm, I'm fixing to preach up in here. See, when Jesus died on the cross, his blood canceled everyone's past, present, and future sins. And everyone who accepts Christ becomes our brothers and our sisters. We're equal in Christ Jesus because we have the same dad. That was God's way of making heaven come to earth and let all of us be sons and daughters, equal heirs to the throne, which, by the way, it changed our citizenship. We no longer belong to this land that we're walking upon. We belong to another land that's in glory. And our citizenship is in heaven beside the right hand of our Father God. And I want everybody, all y'all jokers, there with me. Every tribe, nation, every skin color, I want all of you there because it's going to be a massive wedding party. And everybody's invited. Every single person alive is invited. And I'm glad Jesus didn't just say, hey, Blake, man, I love you. And I accept you, but that was it. It wasn't just accept it, acceptance. He forgave me. He loved me. He made me his child. And so the way that I want to say that is acceptance of other people isn't enough. We're called to love like heaven loves. Don't just accept. You give them a place in your life, in your heart, and around your dinner table. And you know, here at Chase Oaks, we're serious about this. I don't know if you are even aware, but 90% of you have no idea we have a ministry that's called the Family Center. And this ministry is actually very serious about helping our immigrant neighbors thrive. And I'd like you to learn a little bit more about it. Welcome to the Family Center. The Family Center is a place designed to serve our community. We provide programs as needed, like if there's a, a law change and we need a workshop for students who are um, trying to become U.S. citizens, we will do pop-up workshops. Uh, we offer other things such as uh, vaccines for schools, right before school starts. 
um, and then of course our English classes, our citizenship classes, um, and this is also the place where all campuses come together uh, to serve our community through School Zone and Toy Zone. 100% of our citizenship class students and our English class students are immigrants. And for immigrants, it can be really scary to arrive to this country, not speak the language, not be familiar with the area, not um, know the culture here. So our goal is to help them get um, established here and connected and to learn some English, prepare for citizenship exam and make friends along the way. We have several different opportunities for volunteers here at the Family Center. One of our biggest needs are always teachers. We always need uh, people to come and help teach. You don't have to have any experience to be uh, an English class teacher or to assist in our citizenship classes. Um, all you have to have is desire to help others and help get them connected. Would you guys give them a hand? Amazing. Amazing. I'm telling you, this church is so special. And we all play our part, don't we? We all have our little thing that makes us tick in the kingdom of God. God has a place for each of us individually to love people that aren't like you, that don't think like you, they don't do like you do, right? And that's the way that you guys continually blow me away. Your small groups around here, what they're doing right now and the way that they're unexpectedly surprising people with the love of God is awesome. My small group that we meet with on, online, um, they're doing like an LGBT parade and they're like gonna walk and just love on people and get to know them. And there's another group of people that are going to like this um, Islamic temple and they're gonna do like a beautification project around their building. Amazing, what? That, that is just ra it's radical, I'm telling you, it's weird. It's weird, it's beautiful though. It's loving people that, that are very, very different than us and that's the heart of this church. And so what is it for you? Maybe for you, if you have the gift of hospitality, it's time to have a small group at your house. If it's crocheting or knitting, or like my wife, she loves to like make baby blankets and give them to anybody that had a baby, no matter who they are. Uh, I love that. Whatever it is, let's love big. Let's love in a way that exal exal exalts Christ and makes, makes heaven come to earth through the simple, small acts that we do day to day, right? Let's, let's use our gifts. Maybe it's, it's giving, and you, have, you love to write checks and fund stuff. If that's you, my address is, um, <laughs> I'm just playing. I do want us to learn to be crazy generous with all that God's given us in our acts and abilities and our talents, but also in the way that we use the resources and the money that God's given us. And so uh, Pastor Jeff would like to talk to you about that for just a second, so watch this. Well, thank you for participating in Love Does the Unexpected. It's been so cool to see so many people act surprisingly uh, along with our church projects and then to share broadly. I've seen uh, all kinds of great ideas and great things happening, whether it's with the church projects or just people on their own uh, showing unexpected love uh, wherever they are. Really cool. Um, part of Love Does the Unexpected is also give generously. It's act surprisingly, give generously, share broadly. And today is the day uh, forgive generously, and really, and really this week, an opportunity to give to some much-deserved organizations who, in some cases, will be really surprised that we, that we care. That's part of the, the big fun of this process. And so we're going to raise money today and this week uh, in order to bless them financially. This is a separate fund, uh, kind of a separate offering outside of our normal, normal budget and normal Giving And it'll, it'll be divided three ways between three organizations. The Aid Services of Dallas uh, that provides support, housing, uh, care for those with HIV AIDS. Um, so Aid Services of Dallas. The Bail Project, uh, which provides, uh, where we pay people's bail and provide some wraparound support uh, for them, uh, as well as our area food banks uh, to make sure that they um, are replenished and full. And so we want to take that to an unexpected scope. We just want to overwhelm them with generosity. So this fund will go to those, uh, to those three organizations. And I realize some of you may be new and you think, we're doing what with bail or doing what with AIDS? Doing what with... And if that's where you're coming from, I get it. And you can go on our website and there's a, a lot of information about what this is about and why we would do that. So for those who want to participate by giving generously, here's how we're going to do this today. And really, there's an opportunity through the week. But hey, let's do it today. Let's, in fact, we can do it right now. Uh, you can pull out your smartphone, uh, go on uh, the Chase Oaks app, or go on our website. 
and uh, and you'll see opportunities to give to Love Does the Unexpected, and and we can just do it now. If you're not really running it that way, and and would rather uh, give, uh, you know physically check or cash or something like that in the lobbies of all the campuses. You'll hear about how you can do that, but there's an opportunity as you leave today to do that. If you need a little bit more time to kind of look it over, think it over, pray about it, uh, you can also give uh, through the week and just go online and give that way. And this is going to be really fun to see uh, what God's going to do. Um, I, I'm always surprised um, I don't know why I keep being surprised, but I'm always surprised by the generosity of Chase Oaks, and I know our community is going to be. Uh, these organizations are going to be just blown away, and we have the opportunity to surprise them with unexpected love and, and unexpected help. So thank you again so much for participating. It's such a great time, such a great season in our church. Amen. 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 So, yeah. Chase Oaks, thank you for your generosity. Uh, the way that you give, I'm believing right now that God's going to fund all of those things above and beyond. Food banks are going to be filled and people will be loved um, in, in massive ways. Here's, here's what I'd like to end with. We are Jesus people who unashamedly do Jesus things. And so I'm really proud of the way that you continually do that. You act surprisingly by doing things that people are like, What? And you, you give generously and you, you share the love and the truth of Jesus like very few churches I've ever seen. And in our world today, if there's ever been a time when we need people to show the love of God, it's now. And it's, it's, there's a lot of despair and hopelessness and hatred. And so I just want to encourage you to be a part of this movement, to, to change the perception so that people can see a clear view picture of who Jesus is by the way that you live and what you say and what you do. Will you guys pray with me? Father, thank you for helping us show up in unexpected ways, not just here in our city, but internationally. Send us, God. Let us be people who, who quiet cynicism, that show love in the face of apathy, that are a beautiful example of you, God. Thank you for putting your word in our heart. Thank you for dying on the cross so we could understand and experience your love and grace so that we'll love in big ways. Let us not show love in little ways. Let us show love in, in big ways because of the enormous amount of love and grace you've given to those of us who have been forgiven much. So, Father, we want to give you all the glory for what you've done in our lives. And may we honor you with the way that we speak about you and the way that we love with our hands and our hearts and around our dinner tables, Father. May we be accepting and, and loving of all people, no matter who they are. In the name and the power of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said, amen, amen. amen.